they put those wolves in slow motion on the video. I was furious in a three county area here. We've lost around th over 3,000 head of cattle in the last four to five years, and the kids don't want anything to do with it. We sell 50,000 pounds of ground beef a year. And we aren't gonna grow lettuce out here. We aren't gonna grow potatoes out here. We aren't no. gonna grow pumpkins out here. We're gonna grow beef out here. I, I don't use the term agriculture a lot. I talk about food production because I don't think that our general population equate what I do on the landscape with the food that's sitting on their plate. By the end of this interview, hopefully you will have a little better grasp on the immense pressure all of these issues are putting on your rural America and how those issues and rural America affect you directly. Hey. Oh, come on in. The. This is life, but you know that. Yes, I do. <laughs> I know that was our son calling. Oh, okay. He, yeah, he yeah. works on the ranch with us. Too. Okay, yeah. which is great. Yeah, Your son it is good. works on the yeah. ranch with you. So we're yeah. talking about, you know, the financial aspect of wolves not normally taking out taxpayer right. dollars to put them in here right which i think is ridiculous when you already have them yeah. but yeah that's um, another whole story yeah, that's a whole nother <laughs> issue but then also the impact that that has you're saying how many ranchers have so you've we, lost already we've lost in in a three county area here we've lost around th over three thousand head of cattle in the last four to five years here in a couple of counties. Just in four to five years? Yes, yes. Um, one family north of us uh, sold the ranch to uh, someone from the East Coast who uses it as a hunting property. Um, very little tax base left there. Um, they went to Nebraska. Um, a family that is just selling a ranch out in uh, south of us here. The dad died with little or no estate plan and the kids don't want anything to do with it. They run 1,500 head of cows somewhere in that neighborhood. They um, are selling the cows Monday, and that ranch has been sold off in a couple of different pieces. A couple of ranches, again, up on uh, uh, Glade Park here, pretty close to us, they have sold the cows, but still have the ranches in the family. What's gonna happen there so is what are, anybody's what's on guess. The ranches? Um, nothing. Nothing. No, they they do a little bit of hunting. They do still own the ranches, um, but no, the cattle. There's no, there's no um, economic base from that from that ranch. We're losing all these cattle already, and then you put in a predator. Yeah. How is this going to impact ranchers? Have you heard like some ranchers what they're talking about doing or? Northern Colorado, um, the, the Gittleson family have been probably the most heavily impacted. You know, it's, I always say it's, it's really um, low probability that you're going to be directly impacted, but it's high impact if you are, if you win the wolf lottery. There's a lot of hand wringing. There's a lot of um, out the window conversations. There's a lot of um, anxiety, you know, and, and I always try to talk too about from a mental health standpoint, you know, in agriculture, we see um, the suicide rate is significantly higher than it is in, in other occupations. And what do you think that is? It's the stress. And here we are, we're adding a huge stressor, a huge stressor into it. And it's not only about the money. It's, it's about seeing these cattle torn up, ran through fences, um, just treat it in all the ways that we know are not right. And so to see that again and see that, know that that's coming to us, it, it's very intense. It's very intense. I've been to a couple of meetings where it was mostly ranchers in the room. And honestly, you could cut the air with a knife. It's been a, a very frustrating situation. When I saw the video of the release of those wolves where they put it in, Coming from CPW, they put those wolves in slow motion on the video, showed it more as a documentary versus a news item. I was furious. I was absolutely furious. I called our, our local CPW folks. I called several levels up in CPW. I called our legislators, talked to our legislators and said, you, we need you guys to push back and push back hard on CPW and the Department of Natural Resources around this. And they did. Our legis some of our legislators from both sides of the aisle um, have pushed really hard on CPW and the commission and how they've handled this. And that's, 
I, I don't know. Will it make a difference? Only time will tell. I don't know that people realize what the importance of the CPW, like any, um, the wildlife organization of any state and the relationship, the importance of relationship mm -hmm. with private land owners, because as much as people may not like it, wildlife is using private land all the time. Mm -hmm. So in fact, many, most of the time you have the forest areas are the public land mm -hmm. and then you have the private land is the lower land. So you have, which has typically more feed on it. You have water. hay fields and mm -hmm. water and, you know, sub irrigation and, you know, willows and things like that. So you have all kinds of animals coming down and utilizing these private lands, moving back and forth between the public and mm -hmm. private. So the relationship between those wildlife organizations and landowners is so, so important because when it gets tested and then you start testing whether the wildlife organizations are even allowed to access that land anymore, yeah. that can cause a huge problem yeah. for people, right? Yep. The relationship between Colorado Parks and Wildlife and landowners, ranchers, is significant. In this is a, a rural electric magazine. And there's an article on the, the front cover here. It's um, gaining ground for the black-footed ferret. And Colorado Cattlemen's Association is mentioned in this article several times as being absolutely instrumental in the recovery of the black-footed ferret. Because Colorado Cattlemen's Association, number one, worked to get um, a passage of uh, a bill through the legislature and then worked closely with um, Parks and Wildlife around getting the black-footed ferret on the ground. And they still are. So that relationship is absolutely crucial to the success of wildlife in Colorado. And you're exactly right. Um, right now, the relationship between Colorado Parks and Wildlife and um, the landowners and the ranchers and the producers, it's terrible. It's terrible. People are just... This didn't uh, help. No, it didn't. And I, I will tell you, I we have, in 2019, we were named Landowners of the Year by Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And it, a lot of it was because of the cooperation and the work that we did together. And that's not happening today. And we're only, what, five years away from that. Mm -hmm. And that's not happening. Um, I don't think that Colorado Parks and Wildlife is is overall working with the landowners. And and I would tell you that, you know, what you just mentioned about um, they like to collar elk on private land so that they can do studies. They like to land their helicopters on private land because it's easier to get to. And and all of those things, um, that's kind of in the balance, balance as to whether those kinds of relationships will continue, at least for the foreseeable future. For some reason, we have gotten to a point where the general public feels it's okay to demonize what ranchers do or that they own land in the first place because they don't feel that they benefit from it, right? Why do you think that is? It I think it's really important that we build those relationships. And, and outdoor recreation, we can either look at it as we can demonize outdoor recreation or we can look at it as an opportunity. I think that's a great place to start in this conversation about... Um, how it's all interconnected, public land, private land, um, the use of each, and what that means to the general public, and what it means to the producers. And let's not forget, it's about food security as well. Is there, are these charlet then? Uh-huh. Are you yep. raising purebred No. Charlet? Well, yes and no. Our commercial herd is um, probably 70% white. Okay. Um, we have some red Angus uh, in them because we AI all our heifers to Red Angus. So that pin up there are the heavies. Um, there's a light in it. <laughs> the heavies meaning? Uh, going to have a calf in the next probably 24 hours to probably two weeks. Okay. Okay, this is the pen that, because we're, so, we're calving so fast, so mm -hmm. we go into a nursery up there, usually for two or three days. Right now they're lucky to stay in the nursery um, 24 hours. because there's so, too many there's of them? There's so many of them, yeah. And then they move into this pin, yeah. Gotcha. So, yeah. What would are... the camera system be for? So, a... it's going to be in that heavy pin. Um, because we're so spread out and we travel so much during this time of the year, somebody has to check these heifers every four hours. I mean, the last three days, somebody's had to be here 
around the clock, but um, usually we check them every four hours. So if we had a camera that I can look at on my phone, then if there's something going on, I can come home. But if there's not, I can keep doing what I'm doing. Because your, your ranch, your place is spread out over like a lot uh, of miles, we right? We are. In the winter, we're spread probably 40 miles. Oh, wow. Um, okay. In the summer, we're probably spread closer to 75 or 100 miles. Wow. That we're spread because we have, we have cattle in the summer. We have cattle on Grand Mesa, which you can't see this morning mm -hmm. up there. We have cattle um, on this. So right behind those towers, we have, we have cattle there. That's Pinion Mesa. And then you can't see it at all, but we'll see it from the ranch up further is the Uncompahgre Plateau. And if you see that little bump, she's talking about the, there's towers. You can't probably mm -hmm. see it on here, but there's towers right on the top of that. She's talking behind that even. So, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's, that's a good distance away yeah. right there even. Yeah. So. And to the wolf issue, you know, we're not as concerned, obviously, about wolves here. Like at the home place. Right here. Right. We're not worried about wolves here. However, the bulk of our cows, so 400 head of cows calve out at the ranch. And, and that'll, you know, at some point, we'll, we'll see wolves there. We'll oh, yeah. see wolves there. So one of the things that we are doing um, proactively, we hope, is... Um, we're going to be getting some guard dogs. What well, we're talking about dogs for protection, they actually just run with the herd. They don't stay with you ever. Right. They're just out with the herd. Right. And um, they bond with the herd, and then they kind of protect the herd from predators. And we've got four pups that are in training. Um, they've, they've been raised with uh, some calves. So for the first six weeks of their lives, the calves were in a pen next to them. And... Um, Last week, the gal who has them sent me pictures of, she put them in with the calves, and then about two days later, she sent me a picture of one of the dogs laying on top of the calves. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, they're getting acclimated and beginning to know those cattle are their friends. So we'll, we'll use those this summer on some private land that we run a couple hundred head of cows on. Look there, there's a white calf. So that, some, when you're crossing these, a lot of times you'll get both colors, right? So well, so or some of these registered. No, they're not registered, but they're purebred. Okay, they're purebred. So the white one. So when we AI, my son is the technician, mm -hmm. and he he one hand hates this, and the other hand it's a good thing. We AI, and then we turn them right out into the pen with bulls. Sorry, buddy. Oh, he's all right. And so we know the success of the AI because they're red. Gotcha. <laughs> or whether the bull got it and it's a white So it's one. pretty strong. It, it, that color is pretty strong it, it then is, in the, in the Charlotte. Strong, yeah, it's a very strong. You sell beef directly to customers. Uh -huh. Ground beef. Just so ground beef, okay. Mostly. All of our market cows and bulls. So we have not sold a cow through the sale barn in probably probably six or seven years. For a couple of years, we sent our cattle on trucks to the Kuna, Idaho cow plant. Um, but for probably the last three years, we have not sold a cow except through ground beef. We sell 50,000 pounds of ground beef a year, roughly. Really? So, yeah. so instead of all the cuts like steaks and all but, that? But these are market cows and bulls. So they're, they're older cattle. Okay. Yeah, okay. they're the cattle that are no longer viable for whatever reason. You know, they've got age and, or age, they bad breed. bag. Um, they're open. Yeah. yeah, they're open. Yep. This one must be pretty new still. Yep, he was born last somewhat night. Somewhat wet. Yep, he is still wet, but mm -hmm. he's sucking. That's good. How, how mothering instinct are your cattle? Are they big? Yeah. Like, will they take you on when you're, when you're oh. tagging? No. No, that, and that's, you know, we were talking about that all of our cows come through this system before mm -hmm. they go out. This, this gets the cows acclimated to being used to people. You know, we're, we're in among them close and working them close. Yeah. And it's, it's a balance because mm -hmm. you want them to be when protective. you're out in the prairie, you want those protective cows. You don't want them yeah. to leave their calf somewhere, yeah. but you don't really want them to kill you when you're trying to no. tag either. So. <laughs> Which one is her at, her baby? We don't know. That's what Howard's trying to figure gotcha. out. <laughs> yeah, there's too many were born last night. So. Not that one. No, I don't think that one. I would say that. I would say this is hers. I don't know who this little red guy belongs to. I think that's our problem. Is he doesn't know who his mommy is either. 
Right. <coughs> well, he thinks that's his mom. Well, sucked off three of the other three. Right. <laughs> oh, now easy, girl. Yeah, she's like, that's not it. Uh, <laughs> she's... <laughs> Janie was just talking about her son coming back to the ranch, but they, you had him go away for a little while. Mm -hmm. We wanted him and to go why away. why was that? Well, he needed to know something different than what we do. And he needed to know other people. He needed to make his own contacts and connect his own connections in the world. And, and he did. And he's, you know, he still uses those connections. And um, he has an animal science degree, had some great experiences. He was, uh, he, he livestock judge. He was actually recruited um, to Southeast Kansas to judge livestock at Fort Scott. But he decided to come back. And I think that's, I, I think that's an important piece though, because if they never leave, if the kids never mm -hmm. leave, mm -hmm. all they know is, is that. And sometimes your first inclination is you want to get out of whatever yeah. it is you're in. Yeah. So if you see the world first, you can maybe make a more educated choice on whether yeah. you want to come back or not, yeah. what, don't you think? Absolutely. That's what we wanted him to not have regrets. You know, we hoped he would come back, but we wanted it to be his decision and his choice. And, and I got to say, he's come back and rolled up his sleeves and gone to work. And his wife is from Kansas, and she's definitely um, a part of our family and a part of what we do and is all in. A lot of times I hear especially young people saying that, you know, it's really hard to come back because it's hard for the other generation, I hate to say older generation, <laughs> um, the older generation to let go of mm -hmm. some of the management and some of the way we've always done things. And, and I think we've done a really good job of that. I think Howard has been a... Of letting go, you of mean? Of letting go and taking Dean on as a full partner. And I think that's a really important piece when you're looking to bring the next generation in. But we've, this is something we've been talking about with Dean since he was six years old. We've talked about what it's gonna look like. And so we've continued that conversation through high school. We continued it through college. We have weekly family meetings. Um, we sit down once a week and we have an agenda and we look at what we accomplished last week and we look at everybody's schedule for next week and we talk about what things need to be done, who needs to call who. And it just really kind of keeps the lines of communication open. I think that's a big piece of well, huge what we do. part. Because if is. you don't, the biggest thing with family is miscommunication <laughs> or no communication at yeah. all, which yeah. is the most common yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. And nobody really knows who's supposed to do no. what. No. And they're expecting somebody yeah. to do it and they don't yeah. do it. And then and somebody's then, mad. And, yep. Yeah. So that's been a big piece for us. And I, I just, I look around and as I look, we, we were talking earlier about, you know, especially the legacy farms and ranches and how can they continue. I think that intergenerational transfer is one of the, one of the pieces that, Frankly, we need some help with, you know, we need some help I, with. I definitely think so. And it's, yeah. it's like people expect it to just go smooth just because they're yeah. your kids or, yeah. and it doesn't. No. Families fall out all the time yeah. over ranches yeah. because it's yeah. figuring out who's going to do what and how they're mm -hmm. going to do it. And it's. So I, we're, we're a product of exactly what you're saying. Um, my family, I'm fourth generation to produce high quality protein in Western Colorado, but we did not benefit from any intergenerational transfer of land or assets. Howard and I started with 20 head of cows and 20 head of sheep 40 some years ago. And we lease a lot of land and we have a lot of partners in um, the people that we work with, but we've done it. We worked in town for 35 years. Um, to build it, but the whole time we were building it, we had our eye on the goal and knew what we were going to do. Um, so it can be done, but those family relationships, as the family fell apart, um, my, my grandma, in her will, specifically cut my mom's family out of the ranch. Mm -hmm. And my cousins spent the next 30 years fighting over it. And Howard and I built um, the ranch that we have today. And I think that's um, you know, that, that's not the best way to do it, but again, it can be done starting from square one. Absolutely. So, so basically you're a first generation rancher. I mean, you, you came from, from ranching background, yeah, so you yeah. knew how to do it. Yeah. The education of being a rancher and how to deal with livestock and yeah. horses and everything is massive amounts yeah. of education. It's just not through a school, right? Well, I, and I will tell you that, you know, I have a call, I have a bachelor's degree and, um, Howard has a certificate in auto mechanics, and so I'm a firm believer in continuing education. But 
does it, college isn't for everybody, but I really think that in in agriculture, just because of what you said, we have to get out. We we wear so many different hats, and we have to be able to think critically. We have to be able to think independently. We have to be problem solvers. Mm -hmm. And when you're going to some sort of continuing education, those are some of the skills you learn. I mean, you may have specific hands-on skills, but those soft skills, if you will, are really critical to being a successful rancher, in my opinion. Not only that, but if you're starting from scratch um, or starting from mm -hmm. nothing, yep. you have to be profitable. So you yep. have to be, which means yep. you have to be creative. Yep. And it's a little different than just taking over the family ranch. And because and, sometimes you feel that it's already there and you don't yep. need to... You know, you can get complacent that mm -hmm. way, I would mm -hmm. say. Were you, your family ranch, was it around here? Yes. Or was it in a different area? Uh, no, it was in the Unaweep Canyon. Okay, so, so you were up, you're still in yeah. the same area. We are, and actually, um, three weeks ago, we just closed on a property that was in my family. Um, my grandpa bought it on his deathbed, signed the papers the day before he died, was in our family for a number of years, then has been out of the family for... 20, 25 years, and Howard and I just purchased that ranch um, a couple weeks ago. Okay. And it's in the Unaweep Canyon, so that's a pretty exciting step for us. That is very unique that you're able to afford land. Yeah, and we, you know, remember, we worked in town for 35 years. Right. Um, we actually have retirements, both of us do, because of the work that we did. We, for 15 years, we were self-employed. I owned a restaurant, pizza restaurant. Okay. Um, and Howard owned an automotive shop. Um, before, in 2015, he sold, well, actually in 2010, he sold his shop and went to work on the ranch. In 2015, I sold my pizza shop. And so we were able to reach a goal that we'd had since we were 18 years old. Just took 35 years to get there. Right. It's not an overnight thing. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> You're not going to just jump into ranching and go no. buy a 10,000 no. acre ranch. No. It's just not going to yeah. happen. No, it's not. It's or not. if you did, it'd probably be a total disaster well, anyway, because you don't want to, you don't right. want to start with 10,000. Right. You want to, you know. Right. <laughs> I, I think, you know, a lot of times we talk about the only way to get into a ranch is to marry it or inherit it. And I always laugh because that didn't work out for Howard. Mm -hmm. um, and so it can be done and it can still be done. I spoke with a young couple yesterday that are probably in their, I don't know, mid to late 30s. And, and they're making it work. They work hard, but they are making it work. And you lease land, you work with older producers, you find ways to get it done if you really want to do it. Wouldn't, wouldn't, don't you think it's a little easier though in areas that you have less winter, a little bit better? I mean, cause I, I'm, th I think it's always been, it, it'd be easier in like Tennessee Arizona. or, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Oklahoma where yeah. you don't have a whole lot of winter. So you yeah. don't have that hay problem. But they have droughts. They do have droughts. Yeah. I mean, I'm and not so, familiar with their. Yeah. So I think each area kind of has its unique um, capabilities, if you will. Oh man, this is clean for a. Well, it's brand new. I see. <laughs> it has. So it a, hasn't gotten dirty it yet. It has huh? 14, almost 1,500 miles on it. Oh wow! <laughs> I told you I wore out a pickup chasing wolves. Uh huh. Gotcha. <laughs> Trying to to uh, oppose Keep, the oppose wolves. in yes. opposition to the wolves. I wore out a pickup. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to... We're going to go to the processor and pick up uh, probably four boxes of meat, maybe okay. five. That um, you're selling? Uh -huh. That's your, your beef? Yeah, our beef. Um, I'll take it and put it in a freezer up yonder because I have um, customers this afternoon that are waiting for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and you deliver it right to them or um, they kind of meet you places? Or? Some of both. Some of my customers prefer to come to the ranch and or the farm as we call it up here and see the cows and some prefer that I just take it to their door. Um, so I, I've delivered, it's interesting, we were talking about the local meat piece. Um, I've been in multi-million dollar mansions around the valley here, and I've been to the trailer house parks that are um, where people are struggling. And so it's really interesting how this local meat movement, what it means to different people. Mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a single mom that just has one son that's now a teenager. I've been taking meat to her for four or five years. And she, um, there was a sheep camp. She, Sorry to distract you. No, that's okay. I was I saw that sheep camp. Yeah. And I, <laughs> she um, gives me an envelope. I probably deliver to her every three or four months, and she gives me an envelope where she puts um, 
ten dollars a week cash in this envelope that has Van Winkle beef on it and she saves to buy that meat for her family and that that's to me that's really touching you know that that's important to her to know where her meat comes from and know what the quality is and have a relationship with her producer um, that's it's kind of amazing yeah because I think that's like it's almost taken you're taking to me you're taking more responsibility for what you're eating mm-hmm. the closer you mm-hmm. are to where mm-hmm. it comes from right mm-hmm. so when you're, she's buying it from you she knows you then right she knows the person that's right. raising that and right. that's that's unique it it's is. kind of cool well it is cool and I, I always struggle around this trinity so this goes back to kind of what you and I were talking about earlier with yeah. the big packers and all of that um When people tell me that, you know, our meat is so much better than what they buy in the grocery store. And Howard thinks I'm nuts for even having this conversation, but I always tell them that, you know, it's possible that the meat you're buying in the grocery store came from Van Winkle Ranch because we sell into the mainstream food supply chain. Mm -hmm. And if it didn't come from Van Winkle Ranch, it most likely came from another family ranch very similar to ours. The difference in grocery store meat and what you buy from me is in the aging process which is pretty pretty different it's very different it's very different so i i age all of our meat um, you dry age it right dry age for okay. three weeks for three weeks yes. 21 days yes 21 days and so that's significantly different than what happens at jbs in Greeley when um an animal is harvested on monday and is probably on the grocery store shelf on friday mm-hmm. and that's that's the big difference. Um, it's not as much about the handling and the, as much about the feeding. It's the difference in the meat has to do with the aging process. But I always appreciate that you're buying beef, whether it works best for you to buy it in the grocery store or whether it works best for you to buy it directly from your producer. I'm up for either one as long as you're eating beef. I've never cooked a chicken in my 40 some years of being married. Really? That's a true story. Wow. (laughs) I wear that as a badge of honor. So a lot of beef ranchers that I know, they like chicken because they don't get it very often. You know, it's like, oh, chicken. They order chicken when they go out to eat because it's like, oh, I just eat beef all the time. No, we eat beef. So first of all, what bundle of meat do you guys sell? What types of meat do you sell? And where do you sell? Where does somebody, if they live near Grand Junction, you don't Mm -hmm. ship it, right? I don't ship. That that is adding a whole nother layer of complexity on this. But... Um, so if they're around here, where do they get it also? So they call me or through Facebook, um, they message me, and um, we sell ground beef and we sell tenderloins. Those are the only two things we sell. And I, I have a working family bundle that's 20 pounds of ground beef and four packages of tenderloin. It's $185. And that's some that will hold, you know, a family for a month or so. So and what is that per pound? What, what does that come out to? Um, I, my ground beef is $7 a pound. Mm-hmm. And that tenderloin, we're selling the tenderloin really cheap, frankly. But they're not, they're not consistent. Um, they, it comes out about $22, $23 a pound on the tenderloin. Okay. And, and it's, they're amazing. But they're never the, they're not what's the your, same. What's your Facebook page, though? What, oh, oh, oh. Because it, it's uh, not you personally, right? No, it's, it's Van Winkle Ranch. Got it. Uh, is where I sell most of the meat is off of the Van Winkle Ranch page. Now, the packing plant we're going to, the, this this is a processor. Is uh-huh. this USDA uh-huh. It is. In order inspected? to sell at retail, we mm-hmm. have to be USDA inspected. Um, and I have a great relationship here. This is one of her customers. And you're buying a half a beef? Yes. So... Why is it important to buy a half a beef from somebody that you know? Or is that part of the equation for you? I think buying local beef is an important part of the equation. You know, knowing that it's raised and processed here locally is huge. So to be able to support local businesses and obviously local ranchers is an important part of, I think, just being here in Western Colorado, period. Mm-hmm. It's nice to know where it comes from and Absolutely. Yeah, you know your support and family. Yeah, Absolutely. that's right. You know it's all right here, right? Yep. 
Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Appreciate it. And besides that, she thinks we have all of our ducks in a row, or we're all dialed You're in. Dialed in. Yeah. All <laughs> dialed in. Yeah. See, ducks in a row, that's the one we use up in Montana. We're like, <laughs> all are ducks in a row. So we were talking on the phone uh, when I said, how did you know about us? She said, well, I've done some research and looked at different ranches, and it seems like you guys are pretty dialed in. Yeah. And okay. I, just, I just burst out laughing. <laughs> she did. She's like, well, I'm glad you think that we're dialed in. <laughs> Sometimes we don't think we're dialed in. <laughs> It appears that way. So right. I mean, that's like 75% of the battle, yeah. I think. So, anyway, exactly. we've had a good laugh over yeah. that. So, cool. it, so right. can anybody come here? This is a public place to, to come mm -hmm. here to get your cattle butchered to yeah. sell to the public? Uh -huh. How many cows a week are you guys killing? We would kill like 30. That's okay. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. So, we'll see some of the. Uh, yeah. The wrapped packages with our logo and everything on it, too, up at the other farm. Okay. We have a ton of partners. We lease from the city of Grand Junction. The ranch is out at Whitewater. They own them for the water. And years ago, the city council made the commitment to keep them in production as long as they could. Okay. So the water that we use in the summer to irrigate comes to town and is the municipal water in the winter. Okay. They didn't dry the places up like a lot of the municipalities have done. They've, they've committed to keep it in production agriculture. That's good. It's very cool, mm -hmm. very cool. A lot of times we picture ag land as always being like way out removed from any kind of congestion or subdivision, but nowadays subdivisions are definitely moving in around these places. So this is one spot you can see there, some of their cattle over there. These spots are very congested. They're right in the middle of, it's surrounded by civilization, not well as civilization, um, surrounded by residential areas. So on top of selling beef, um, she sells ground beef and tenderloin. She also sells ground organ meat for dog food. I think that's very unique. And she said some people even cook this stuff. I, somebody's gonna have to tell me how that smells when you cook that. Um, my dad has very unfond memories of liver and onions growing up. I don't know if you've had liver and onions, but... Uh, no, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so she's just starting to change. You're just starting to change mm -hmm, to, mm -hmm. to a new packaging system that looks yep. like this. That's kind of cool. And it has your, your ranch brand on there. Yep. And, and our, our, our bags, we've used these bags for a long time. Yeah, cool. Yep. <laughs> I, I don't know. Because I do weird things, I would like to try tongue sometime. Yeah, but, I'm not up for it. Yeah. I'm not, but so the dog food piece is interesting because that's added value to those carcasses. It doesn't right. cost me any more to get it processed. Okay. It doesn't cost me any more because if I don't take it, then it's, it is a bonus to the processor. But he processes it, wraps it up for me, and it's added value to those cows. Great. This land right here, you lease from... The, the university, the yes. University. Yes, it's owned, it's owned by the university. Um, history so those facilities down there there's no longer anyone living in there but um, this was the regional center center the regional center so folks handicapped folks mentally handicapped folks lived down there and when my husband was a child he can remember this was a working farm and all the food for that facility was produced here they had vegetables they had a dairy they had pigs sheep chickens and beef cows. I see. And I've spoken with people who worked down there during that time and the food was amazing. So isn't it interesting that here we are in 2024 and we're all excited about direct to farm, direct to consumer marketing when not that long ago this was this was a facility that raised all the food for the clients at the regional center. Because then the college actually had an ag program here for probably 10 or 15 years. Okay. And when they discontinued their ag program, um, they sold all the pieces and parts. And we actually bought the corrals over here and didn't get around to moving them. And then we ended up leasing it, so the corrals are all intact. We, we have a huge theft issue here. We kind of struggle oh, with yeah. a lot. Yeah. Be because of where it's located? This is yeah. centrally kind of? Yeah. We have cameras here. We just caught a guy 
they've been stealing, stealing stuff out of here a lot. They stole a, a couple guns out of some pickups, stole oh, no. tools, um, just some pipe, a lot of things here. They were stealing hay, and finally I got totally mad about it. Called the city, it, this is in the city, mm -hmm. called the city cops. They came out and put a GPS tracker in two bales of hay. Oh. And kind of set a trap, and I'll be because I said, "How are you guys going to make him take those two bales of hay?" And Howard said, "Well, I know what he likes. Set him out there, and within 12 hours, he took them." Wow! And so the, it was at midnight that he took them, and the cops um, followed it and found things that had been stolen from here two years ago. Oh wow! So that we haven't had any place. problems since. Oh yeah. Well, well that's yeah. good. Maybe it was just one person, huh? It appears in the last few years that it has been. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we yes. had a we had when we had a bunch of small scars one time next to the highway. Oh yeah. yeah. And and one of our neighbors saw somebody loading some hay, so he pulled in there, and the guy said, "Oh yeah, I'm just bought some hay," so he helped him load it. Oh gosh. And it was. <laughs> He, had, he was stealing hay. Hey, very brazen, very yes, brazen and bold. Yes, the the things that go into our branded beef program, the Van Winkle Ranch program, they're fed grain for 60 days, and that's long enough to turn the fat from yellow to white. Okay. And it gives it the grain-fed flavor, but gotcha. it's still lean. It's 85 to 90 percent lean. Um, these cows are going to go to the food bank of the Rockies, and they are on hay for 60 to 90 days, but not fed grain. So it doesn't do the same thing? It doesn't turn the fat, it's a little, you get more of a grass fed flavor. Okay. With that. Is so grass finished flavor? Yes, 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 yes. yeah. Yeah, because there is a difference between grass fed and grass finished. Sometimes if you see well, that label, it's... So I, so I use the term, I, our cattle are grass fed and grain finished. Mm -hmm. And then these cattle that go into the food bank are grass fed all the way through. All the way through. Yeah, yeah. And I actually prefer the flavor of grain yeah. or corn finished. I mean, we it, do too. It's like a, it almost feels like you're eating candied meat sometimes. Yeah, yeah, we do too. And that's, so I don't sell anything that's not grain finished to our branded beef program. And my answer always is, if you like grass fed beef, great. Great. Our family likes grain fed, and I eat out of the same freezer I sell you meat out of, and mm -hmm. I don't want any grass fed meat in there. Right. So that's how we do that. I mean, technically, they're grass fed yeah. up, up yeah. until you finish them. 60 but days. At Those, the end, yeah. you put that yeah. little bit of grain or, or uh, corn in there, yeah. and it just adds it's, so much flavor to it. And it's changed, it, you can tell by the color of the fat. I didn't, I yeah, didn't know that. Yeah, you change the fat from yellow to white. So anything that's grass finished will have yellow fat. So if you look at an elk or a deer, mm -hmm. it's yellow. yellow fat. Sure. Okay. If you see a grass finished animal, they're yellow fat. Okay. And, and there's no difference nutritionally, safety, anything else. It's a matter of preference on the flavor. And my family prefers grain finished, and so that's what we do. Right. So there's no difference really nutritionally, maybe, but no. there's a difference in flavor. Yes. Because it, it does yes. taste different. Yeah. And the other difference that people are always surprised to learn is around environmentally. You assume right. that it's more environmentally friendly if it's grass finished. Mm -hmm. And that's actually incorrect because it takes 220 days longer to finish something on grass than it does grain. Therefore, you're using more resources, more land, more water. Very interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Largest what? flat top mountain. Largest flat top mountain. And it's that's, a, that's, that's it. That's that one yep. way over there. It's so a, up on top, it's flat. It's flat as pancake. Mm -hmm. It is flat as a pancake. Um, and it goes, I don't know, probably 20 miles that way. And it goes a ways, probably 15 miles that way. Now, how did you get, just to, being as you started without owning something, uh -huh. usually usually BLM leases come with owning a, part, a ranch that have a lease with <coughs> so How did you acquire a BLM lease? So this BLM lease, lease goes with the city property. I so see. this fenced area, this begins the um, fenced area. Here is the city property oh, okay. that we lease. Um, so when you started, you you started when you started ranching. Your family was ranching, so you have the education from <laughs> yeah. growing up. But yeah. when you started ranching, you started with the leases. We did. We had I had twenty head of cows, and Howard had twenty head of sheep, and we. How'd you My, find your first lease? I mean, I um, <laughs> you know, that gravel pit, to be honest, was probably our first list, lease down there on D Road. We didn't go a quite, I showed it to you. Mm -hmm. um, 
Howard had grown up around there his whole life, and when we started looking for places to put 20 head of cows, started asking questions, and pretty soon, boom, we, we were, had that little farm. It had, I don't know, it must have had 30, 40 acres of farm ground and some dry lots, and we've just, we live, we worked that for a long time. Um, just a number, just just being around and just being, being around, interacting yeah, with the community, talking to and people, talking yeah, talking to people, yeah. getting to know people. Mm -hmm. it, this this ranch we subleased for a couple of years, and then it came up for lease um, with the city. And there were eleven. It was a competitive lease process. There were eleven people um, vying for that lease. Okay. Um, Bidding was it? A yeah, it was a, a closed bid, but you had to present a proposal to get them here. It's a nightmare. It's a, it's a paperwork political nightmare. Well, I'll bet. They were here for a month and then they were out of here uh, December and January and these cows have just been back here a week. The turkeys over there. Oh yeah, yeah there's a bunch of turkeys out yeah, there. there is. Way out there. Mm -hmm. but This project was $400,000 and that's conservation because now we are using literally half the water we were using and it's three times as productive. Right, right. You know, and that's the- Because you're that's using right. it to irrigate the, the bottom land here. You can see right, the grass. Right, and, and we're producing high quality protein with yep. it. And we aren't gonna grow lettuce out here. We aren't gonna grow potatoes out here. We aren't no. gonna grow pumpkins out here. We're gonna grow beef out here. Right. So I always talk some about- deer. Yep. You know, we, we should see some elk maybe too. I, I, and the other thing I talk about is, like I said, I always, if I get a chance to post a picture of wildlife interacting with the cows, I always do. Mm -hmm. Because there's so much misinformation out there about cows are bad. Right. Um, and I like to show that the cows interact with the wildlife and it's positive for both. Now, the interaction that you might get from wolves and cows may not be what you're looking for. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> you do have a point there. <laughs> you're calving right here, so you're having calves down in this bottom and you mm -hmm. have trees and timber that go all mm -hmm. the way up to the mountains mm -hmm. right next to them in the same pasture here so that's that's going to be a concern when mm -hmm. you have wolves in the area right right being right next to your cows right in your cows mm -hmm. very easy access to your cows and and this is fairly fairly remote i mean we're only 15 20 miles from grand junction but we're still we're, we're pretty remote here. There's not a lot of people here. Right, um, there's nothing that's gonna, like, yeah, not, not a lot of pressure that's gonna keep them out of here, right? Well, there's, so there's a trail above us here that's on BLM that gets some traffic, ATV mostly, some bicycle traffic, um, but it's closed in the winter. It's closed for wildlife purposes in the winter. Okay. So okay. when the cows are here, there's no traffic, there's no, human pressure up there so your your cows just come here for the winter uh -huh. mostly this is where you they're, winter yeah they're, they're here they're here in the blm from about the first of november to the first of june and only about not even half of them are on this ranch okay they look pretty content with life they sure they? do <laughs> yeah. Must be and they're one of in those good days. shape. Yeah, and they're in good shape they're, to go into calving. Mm -hmm. We'll start feeding them as soon as we see 10, 15 calves on the ground. We'll start feeding hay here. Okay. And they'll stay here until April, and then we'll process those calves. We'll vaccinate them, brand them, give them their general herd health checkup, mm -hmm. and then they'll go to the BLM for about six weeks, and then they'll come back in here for less than a week and we'll truck them out of here to the high country okay up to the higher stuff uh -huh. yeah. and you can see the higher stuff is all covered with snow yeah. right now yeah. so <laughs> that's why they come down here yeah. for the for the yeah. winter trying to keep out of that snow yeah. so that's that's 10,200 feet on top of there oh really yeah 
Okay. Yeah. So we're pretty high right here. I don't, I don't know what the elevation is here. So we have a, a recreational piece that is becoming fairly well known in, in the bicycling world. We have, it's called the Palisade Plunge. It's a 32 mile trail that plunges 6,500 feet in that 32 miles. Wow. And we got intimately involved in that um, because it was, originally it was planned to go right across a piece of property that we lease up here on the side of the mountain. And so we had a number of discussions that took some doing, but eventually we were welcomed at the table and ended up that the Palisade Plunge is basically a non-issue for the ranch. But it was only because we spoke up in the beginning and said we want to be a part of this conversation. And finally, the bicycling community and the um, entities that were involved in this trail began to listen. And we, we sat at the table for two years. And ultimately, the trail has very little impact on the ranch. And originally, it would have had a significant impact on the ranch. Just from where it was located? Where it or? was located, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, where it was located. You're leasing ground, that's a good way to get started, but it does come with some risk because an owner yeah. of property can yep. just decide not to have you lease it anymore, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. And these leases, we renew them every 10 years um, because it is with the municipality. Um, we're, we work hard to be a good partner and to communicate and talk about the value, talk about that economic value you and I talked about, um, that every cow contributes six to $800 to our economy here. And you know, that's not lost on a city council member. Oh yeah, right. When, when you put it in terms that we put other businesses in, you know, what's the economic impact of uh, this manufacturing business? How many jobs does it create? And we can say every cow is contributing six to $800 to our economy directly. And by the time you multiply that three and a half times, that's a lot of economic activity that this ranch contributes. Absolutely. And if you, if you just have, what's the problem with like taking agriculture off the land and just, mm -hmm. just having it be recreational? <laughs> that's a, people have that question. I yeah. Mean. The, there's a, there's a number of issues. I mean, you saw the landscape coming up here that's degraded by recreation a lot of times. Uh, ATVs going up these, you know, real vulnerable hills, these slopes, and pretty soon erosion sets in, and that that's a huge problem. And the, the work that we do on these landscapes keeps wildlife. We saw deer coming up here. We saw turkeys coming up here. And that, that alone is impactful to the quality of life, to the residents here. Mm -hmm. And so and, we, t we talk a lot about that. And also economically, just economically wise, the amount of money that's spent in recreation other than hunting, because there's a lot of money spent towards hunting licenses mm -hmm. and things, mm -hmm. but not hunting, there's not a lot of money spent in a local economy, is there? Well, so that's always a great discussion. So I was telling you about the Palisade Plunge that mm -hmm. comes off that point, that high point over there, way yonder, comes around this bench, goes, the piece of property that we lease that was in question is right through these trees here, comes off uh, 32 miles later down there in Palisade. And so the discussion was all the economic impact that was gonna bring because people, this is a world-class trail People come here, it's a bucket list item. That's a rough trail. Mm -hmm. I would and, bet it is. Yeah. <laughs> and so the economic impact of outdoor recreation, what does that mean? And we've also in this community and kind of the Western Slope, we've started to build an outdoor recreation economy. There's some light manufacturing. There's um, a lot of service industry that's connected to it. But you know, when somebody comes here with a bicycle, um, they might eat in a few restaurants. They may or may not stay in our hotels. Um, they only come on the years when the economy is good enough for them to come on vacation. 
And that cow is here every single year mm -hmm. and through every boom and bust cycle. No matter what the economy's doing, that cow is still here. And contributing and it can be there at the same time as recreation right as if we do it right right and if we if we communicate and we work to build those relationships because don't forget those outdoor recreationists they're consumers too don't forget mm -hmm. and a lot of them eat beef and that's really an important piece that we have to remember is that those consumers eat beef as well um and and those outdoor recreation folks i i told you earlier about the story that I'm, I'm riding on a horse next to a guy on a bicycle as we're driving some cows and he looks at me and he says, you know what we do at the end of an epic ride? And I said, tell me. And he says, we go have a burger and a beer. It never occurred to me this is where the burger comes from. Mm -hmm. That's powerful when we're making those kinds of connections. Mm -hmm. um, another thing we did on the Palisade Plunge Trail, there's a kiosk up there on the mountain really? that talks about what the economic impact is of livestock production. It talks about the benefits of grazing. It tells the cyclists what to do if they run into a cow. You know, if they encounter a cow on the trail, what do you do? How do you behave? What, what do you do to get around her? Um, at the end of it, it, it invites them to sit down in one of our restaurants in Palisade and enjoy a Palisade peach, a glass of wine, and a burger from Mesa County. So again, that kind of helps pull that all together to those people that are our consumers, but they're also voters. And in Colorado, based on the WOOF initiative, we've come to understand we've got to form relationships with these voters. Mm -hmm. And so you spent a lot of time as the president of the Cattlemen's Association um, fighting the, the reintroduction of wolves in Colorado. How did you do that and what what did what are the things that you did? I mean, did you just try to keep it? Were you trying to help people understand and vote a certain way, or what were you doing? So, the as as the initiative kind of began to gain gain traction. At first, I think we as producers didn't think this would ever happen. Right. You know, as they were gathering signatures, we're like going, "This is crazy. This will never happen." Once they got all the signatures, I think we began to realize this could happen. So we, we spent a lot of time building coalitions um, around people who had common interests and understanding what the problems with bringing the wolf was going to create here. Uh, I spent a lot of time talking to service clubs, um, spent a lot of time talking to policymakers, you know, just really trying to help people understand what the impact was going to be. Ultimately, we lost the vote by about a half a percent. We lost the vote. And, and it was, you know, I, looking back, I think we as producers, we didn't think it would happen. And so not a lot of us were willing to invest our dollars into the campaign against the initiative. I think if we had it to do over again, I think a number of producers suddenly realized I should have been willing to put even a dollar ahead into that. But a lot of our producers simply weren't willing to do that because they didn't really think it would happen or they thought someone else would do it. And this is, a, I guess, my lesson from all of that is that as producers, we're at a point in time where we have to stand up for ourselves. And sometimes we're going to have to put money into these discussions, <laughs> into these fights, if you will. And um, so that was kind of the piece of bringing that around. And, and we, you know, ultimately we hired a, a firm to run a campaign against it, but we didn't have a ton of money. And the other side was financed by the Tides Foundation. Mm, which and, is un, about unlimited funds. Exactly. So, I mean, how do you yeah. compete with that? Yeah. But we, we were, as producers, we weren't willing to put, to write even a $500 check. And, and so it well, was limited funds. So I deal with a lot of ranchers, you know, talking to yep. them and everything. Yep. And ranchers are just, they're the kind of people, they're... They've been removed from people for a long time. They just want to do their own thing yeah. away from people and let somebody else deal with the, with the political issues. And the problem with that is, is now, with the general public being the way it is, they're very easy to make the enemy because they're silent. They're almost yeah. totally silent over yeah. here. So you can say whatever you want about agriculture, guys, because they're not going to... And they're going to have to now, like you said, mm -hmm. stand up and start voicing those things politically and yeah. in their communities or, yeah. or they won't, or they'll just silently be put out of business, yeah. right? And, and your trade associations matter. 
So your state cattlemen's association, the national cattlemen's association, you may disagree with some of the policies, so get involved. Be a part of that grassroots change. change help change those policies if you disagree with them. But the bottom line is those organizations are fighting for you. And if you're not willing to pay the dues to support that fight, and you're not willing to stand up in your local community, then you know what, what are you going to do? How are you going to make an impact? And I am a firm believer that we have to go outside of our comfort zone. I'm on, I've been on our local Chamber of Commerce board here. And I think that's critical because we're a business. We're, we're recognized as a business, uh, we being agriculture and livestock producers in this area. And part of it's because there's been people over the last 20, 30 years willing to stand up and be on the Chamber of Commerce, get involved as a county commissioner, run for public office, have a voice. And that's really hard to do because like you said, a lot of us, we just want to take care of our cows. That's really all we want to do. Mm -hmm. But it's not, it's not that way anymore. And I tell young people when I'm speaking to a, a group of young people, I, I spoke with a group of young farmers and ranchers at a Farm Bureau convention here a week or so ago. And one of the things I tell them is that advocating for our business is just as an important skill like knowing how to run a fence stretcher, knowing how to drive a tractor, knowing how to manage a herd health program. You've got to know how to advocate and stand up for the business that agriculture is. Yeah, and a lot of people, I don't know that a lot of ranchers even view what they do as like a business yeah. or an industry. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they, yeah. they view it as their family and this is what we do, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they're gonna have, I think it's time, because if, if they just view it as that, they'll lose it. Yeah. I mean, right now, the impact of wolves in the next 10 or 15 years is going to be pretty drastic, financially mm -hmm. on the state itself. Yes. And part of that financial toll is going to be ranchers going out of business because they can't make enough money. Yeah. In several industries, outfitting being one, um, losing and losing animals, having stress in the family, those kind of things are going to cost some of those. And and uh, I, I, what can they do now? Now that it's already here, I mean they've already put wolves here. Do you have any yeah. idea what what they can do now to try to limit this? So, you know, we've had three years of conversations around the rules and the regulations of wolves. And some of our producers got involved, some did not. I think going forward, I, I think we just have to be vigilant about what is happening. We have to be vocal. We have to lead with facts. We can't be giving these outrageous claims. Um, we have to base what we're talking about on facts. And I think we, we've just got to continue being at the table in these conversations. There's, a, there's one provision that I've kicked myself a dozen times that I didn't see it or some of us with the cattlemen's groups didn't see it. So the compensation program, you only are compensated if you have a wolf kill for some of, if you actually have an actual, I'm sorry, if you have an actual predation, then you're eligible for some of the other compensation on indirect losses like weight gain and conception rates. But if you're running in a common forest service allotment and there's two ranchers there, one has a wolf kill, but they both are having indirect losses. Only the one that had a confirmed kill will be compensated for those indirect losses, not both of them. So whoever's animal got killed, then they'll be compensated, the other one won't be. That's a loophole that we didn't see, and, and we need to advocate for that. So as you see issues and problems with the rules and the regulations, you need to speak up. You need to commit it to the, um, the Cattlemen's Association, the Farm Bureau Organization, and then we all need to stand up and say, here's a problem that we need to help fix, and be a part of the solution. Mm -hmm. They're here. We're going to have to deal with it. But we've got to lead with facts, and, and we'll find our way through it, but it won't be easy. Right. And can, can general citizens that understand now, so I, th I, think it's a, I think there's an understanding coming with wolves. They're, I am shocked at how many states now have wolf issues. I mean, yeah. from Northern California and Oregon and Washington and Montana and Idaho and all the way over to Michigan and 
you know, Wisconsin and all mm -hmm. those states and now, and Europe. You yeah. know, I'm getting people talking to me from Europe about all the wolves that are moving in there from Russia. Mm -hmm. This hmm. is, I think people are starting to get an idea that they're definitely not endangered. No. We don't need to protect no. wolves. No. Um, but what can citizens do? I mean, well, or, or can they do anything? I, you know, I'm not one to stand by and say and be helpless. Um, so I think you, you have to, again, I talk a lot about relationships have to have a relationship with your legislative folks, with your county commissioners, your congressmen. You've got to have a relationship and you've got to be able to say to them, call them up and say, Mr. Congressman, here's how this is impacting me directly. We need to find a solution. And I, I think that's a critical piece of this, is building those relationships with policymakers, building relationships with voters slash consumers, you know, continuing to have those conversations, even if there's someone that you don't necessarily agree with. Um, now, a, a very staunch wolf advocate and myself as in Van Winkle Ranch, we are never going to see eye to eye. Right. But there's people in the middle and we need to continue to have that conversation with the movable middle mm -hmm. and, and ask them to have conversations with their policymakers so that again, the policymakers are beginning to see this is an important issue and I need to take a stand and be a part of the solution. Well, thank you so much for taking me around today yeah, and absolutely. Uh, been great conversation about how you guys got started and uh, it's fantastic land over here in the western part of Colorado. It, there's a lot of similar land like like I say in Montana, but you guys start high and go higher. <laughs> we start low and go high, so mm -hmm. we don't get anywhere near this high, but it's uh, it's been a really cool experience and I really appreciate all the insight that we've gotten from you. And so thank you very much. Yeah. We've talked about a lot of things. We've covered a we, lot we of stuff. Have. This is probably going to be more than one video. <laughs> <laughs> We've talked about intergenerational transfer and succession planning. We've talked about um, wolves. We've talked about marketing. We've talked about the Packer issue. Gosh, we've covered a lot of ground. We and, have. And it all impacts um, food production. It all impacts food security, ultimately. Mm -hmm. And and I think we've just got to continue having those conversations. And. Food production and food security will affect everyone. It is, it's not a rancher issue. The no. Food is a, an issue that will affect everybody. So when you're talking about ranchers producing food, keeping ranchers in business is what keeps us yeah. food independent, yeah. right? So yeah. that is a very key thing that the general public and ranchers need to keep in mind. That, that those, That's what those relationships are for. Yeah. Absolutely. Is, is to understand that Everything a rancher does, even though you might not agree with how they do it, especially ones that are worried about conservation and everything, are actually benefiting all the people around you. Yeah, we, we are. We, we talk, sometimes I think the issue of agriculture, like I, I don't use the term agriculture a lot. I talk about food production Which a is, lot more. Exactly. Because I don't think that our general population equates what I do on the landscape with the food that's sitting on their plate. So if I use the term food production and food producers and livestock producers versus ranchers, I mean, it's all semantics, I, I get that. But again, I think it's really important that we, we help our consumers understand that the bottom line is it's about food production, but mm -hmm. it, there's a lot of side benefits, benefits, whether it's conservation of land and water, whether it's, um, the view, the viewscapes. I mean, it's pretty cool standing up here where we're at right now, it's looking incredible. around. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of impacts that the ranchers have on on our society and on our environment. That that people get to enjoy and benefit absolutely. from. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. absolutely.